broadcasting to you on WNN 1470 AM and TrentoVision.tv from the world's leading think tank laboratory, buried deep in an undisclosed building in hostile territory where evil and corruption is exposed. You're about to enter the Tom Trento Show. Now order, now order, call in flag and battle station. Trento heads United West, a group that says it defends Western civilization against the onslaught of Islam. Tonight is Tom Trento from the United West. Tom just came back from an amazing trip to Israel, and I hope he touches upon that a little bit. And Tom is an expert in Sharia, an expert in the dangers that we're facing now from the Middle East. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Tom Trento. <laughs> No one is here to hear me speak, so. Oh. Oh. oh, maybe you are. Okay, I get it. Um, I bring you greetings from uh, that apartheid nation, that occupying nation, that nation of, uh, of hate and uh, that nation of uh, anger, um, the absolute oasis in the middle of a savage jungle. Greetings from Israel to everyone in this room. How many, how many in here have not been to Israel? Okay, that's way too many. Uh, I direct an organization called The United West. It used to be the Florida Security Council. And its focus is on defending that little booklet that was placed over there at the banquet table. Um, uh, the, the Constitution, and one of our other objectives is to, uh, to stand with Israel. Another objective is to defeat Islam, and I've been criticized for uh, not qualifying or, um, or nuancing the concept of Islam, radical Islam, uh, Sharia Islam, all of that. I understand this stuff very well. The, the problem, ladies and gentlemen, is the system of Islam. It's that simple. And until we clearly understand and state in its totality that entity that is creating complete chaos worldwide, particularly in the West, we're not going to be able to defeat that type of enemy. Is every Muslim a terrorist? Of course not. There, there are wonderful people that are sucked up in that system that really don't want to be there. Uh, but they're in it, and we need to reach out, particularly Christians and Jews, need to reach out to them to give them refuge out of that system. It is 90% a political system with a religious veneer. One of the objectives of our organization is to, to defeat the Islamic onslaught in the United States and uh, in, in the West. Another objective is to, um, to defeat all things... Time to clap Obama, to defeat all things Obama. As a loyal Republican, with uh, 383 days until the next election, November 4, 2014, I am seriously considering leaving the Republican Party, particularly in light of the implosion and the failure last night to stand on principle, I am getting fed up with the Republican Party. I've, I've stated publicly, I'll give it two cycles, 14, 16, and uh, if we do not learn to live and breathe and act on principle, there are principles. There are things that are definitive principles by which a party is identified and functions. Once you abandon those, what are you? Why are you? What is that all about? If we're going to lose, let's lose standing on principle. But guess what? There's a silent majority out there. In the last cycle, we, hi Ruth, I didn't see Ruth back there. Hi Ruth, Ruth Roman back there. She works with us too at the United West. Um, uh, last cycle, at least one million 
One million evangelical Christians did not vote in the state of Florida. We lost by 74,000 votes overall. That is a shame. That is a travesty. I'm not here to talk about all that stuff, though. Um, let me just share a couple of thoughts on, uh, on this amazing trip. And when I ask you who has not gone, that's because this trip was so successful that we have scheduled the next trip, November 9th, right after the election next year. Frank Gaffney, Center for Security Policy, myself, uh, will be leading a combination, national security, look at the infrastructure of, uh, of our absolute greatest national security partner, not just in the Middle East, worldwide. Israel is our number one security partner, critical. Do you know what it would cost? Do you know what it would cost in, in money, blood, and treasure to, to be the bulwark in the middle of 330 million enemies in that piece of dirt out there? If we had to put, if, we, if, if there wasn't a Western wall of resistance vis-a-vis -vis Israel, somebody would have to be there, and the United States would have three aircraft carriers and bases, and it'd be insane. Israel is providing that security for every person in this room to sleep well at night. And let me tell you, Israel is a country praying for peace, but preparing for war. <laughs> we had an opportunity to go uh, to the northern edge of Israel, right next to the southern border of Lebanon in an area controlled by a green and yellow flag. Anybody know what flag that is? That's Hezbollah, the Hezbollah flag. The Shia terrorist organization, Hezbollah, controls southern Lebanon. We were in a kibbutz up there with some of the bravest men and women you have ever seen in your life, standing guard at the northern point in Israel, sidearms on their hips, ready to give their lives with any encroachment of Hezbollah over the line, and they're living in an unfortified little area saying, the hell with everybody, Obama, whatever, we're defending our homeland and we'll continue to defend our homeland. Pray for those people. We went over to the Golan Heights. We went over to the Golan Heights that many people want to give back to Syria. Uh, that would have been a wise decision, sure. And uh, we saw the strategic necessity of the Golan Heights. We stood in a settlement, a settlement in Samaria, which is the West Bank. The settlement had nicer homes than many of the suburban areas here in South Florida. 10,000 people in this settlement looking on the top point, looking at Tel Aviv about five or six kilometers away, the skyscrapers, Netanya over here, and Ben Gurion over there. This land would go back to the enemy if this president and this administration had their way. This is the insanity of the national security situation that all of us have to work for in the next 383 days and elect people who understand national security concerns. So get ready, start saving your money, come on the trip with us next year. Um, we also had an opportunity to, uh, to spend a, a Shabbat uh, uh, day in Jerusalem, which was pretty amazing. We were there when the, the rabbi, the chief rabbi died and 800,000 people came to little Jerusalem and shut the town down. Um, and in Jerusalem, everything shuts down on, uh, on Shabbat. Tel Aviv, they're rocking and rolling. Totally different city. Um, Tel Aviv is like New York. And we had an opportunity to go down to Elat, the little town at the southern tip at the Gulf of Aqaba. And uh, it's Miami Beach, you know, in the desert, basically. Beautiful. Huge five-star hotels. Israel is thriving like you cannot believe. Economically, there's a vitality, an integrity, a commitment, a passion of those individuals, those seven million individuals in that nation. We also had an opportunity to go into Jordan. And um, I don't get frightened of too much stuff 
And I wasn't frightened going into Jordan. I was a little concerned. Because when you hand your passport over, it just takes a couple of clicks on Google, and then they know your whole life. And I wasn't quite sure I'd get out of Jordan if they figured that out. But we went to the city of Petra, which is an amazing uh, archaeological discovery, truly amazing. But I'll tell you what, notwithstanding the fact that at the end of the day, when we exited Jordan and had to show our passports to the Israelis, and they gave me a little bit of a hard time. Um, I looked Middle Eastern, and uh, they weren't quite sure who I was, so the Israeli security um, asked me a few questions and made it a little difficult. Uh, Mark over here, can you stand up, Mark? He's, I got, I got Mark. He got in real quickly. <laughs> They're asking me my name, do I speak Hebrew, who do I know here, all this other stuff. <clears throat> but it's an amazing country. Um, tonight's going to be a special night. you got a lot of stuff in the back to uh, buy and, and take home with you. Uh, as you know, I've been involved with the Clarion folks, and we saw them in, in, uh, in the old city. This is Obsession, a movie that changed my life. Many of you have seen it. We have a hundred of them back there. Take as many as you want. They're for free. Please take them with you, hand them out, watch them. Um, we have uh, a fascinating evening, and we're going to go out west to a cowboy, to, uh, to a great guy who uh, I've known for years, and um, uh, he exemplifies an individual who has a commitment and compassion and a desire to be a patriot. He was a um, United States Federal Marshal, law enforcement officer for many years out in Colorado, state I used to live in. And um, in his uh, counter-jihad years, he wanted to figure out how to use his law enforcement background, his Christian training, and his Hollywood shtick, okay? <laughs> Put on a cowboy hat, get a cup of coffee, stand in front of a lake, Say some crazy stuff and get millions of people watching you. So please, please, please put your hands together. Give a warm work welcome to Wild Bill for America. Thank you, Sam. That was good. Well, the Muslim Brotherhood is sanctioning the USA. They have cut off our supply of cab drivers and Motel 6 clerks. And if the U.S. continues to meddle in the Middle East, they will not send us any more presidents. <laughs> now, I saw that press release that CARE put out yesterday, calling this a hate fest, using the typical slanderous language that the enemies of freedom typically use. And I was hoping they were going to show up here tonight because I would like to respond to that. I would like to ask them, what exactly is this hate that they are accusing us of? Is it hatred when we tell the Muslim men that they cannot beat their wives in the United States? Is it hatred when we tell Muslim fathers that they cannot slit their daughters' throats because they were acting too Western? Is it hatred when we tell 50-year-old men that they cannot marry nine-year-old girls. And a nine-year-old girl recently bled to death on her wedding night after being raped by her new husband. What kind of a man would do that? Possibly a member of CARE? Is, is, is the hatred you're talking about when we demand that women be treated with the same respect that men get? Or is it when we declare that the Jewish people have a right to live in their ancestral homeland in peace? Is that the hatred that you are accusing us of? I really want to know. Well, here's a wild bill bullet of truth for care. What you call hatred, we call protecting our children and respecting our women, and you will never stop Americans from doing that. Now, on the way down here, <laughs> I had planned to give a message of cheer and encouragement because that's what I do. That's what comes naturally to me. 
And uh, when Diane asked me to be a part of this weeks ago, I was all set to go and fire up the tea party. But you know what? There is a matter that is concerning me that's been burning in the back of my mind, and I, I need to make this message known. This uh, so-called government shutdown that we've been enjoying lately, it signals a subtle but dangerous shift in the thinking of Washington, D.C. Now, we roll our eyes and we think how silly it is for the feds to pull the handles off the drinking fountains in the park so that hikers cannot get a drink of water, blocking off the World War II and the Vietnam memorials, stopping people from walking up the steps to the Lincoln Memorial. People who owned their home outright were kicked out of it because it was on federal land. And private businesses that cater to the park visitors were ordered to shut down. Now, this is not just a president throwing a tantrum because free men and women refuse to bow down to socialism. This is a president sending a message to the American people that if we cross him, we will be punished. Now, this signals, now, you know, Mr. Obama ordered the federal employees to make this as painful as possible for the American citizens. Now, for decades, elected officials have relied on charm and promises. Vote for me, and I will bring fiscal responsibility, blah, blah, blah. And we roll our eyes, and, and we hold our noses, and we vote for the least scummy candidate all the while telling ourselves, man, we got to do something different in this country. But today we are seeing Washington, D.C. shift from the politics of charm and deception to the politics of intimidation. And this is a very dangerous precedent. And it is my personal belief that the massive voter fraud that we saw in the last two elections is fueling this shift in attitude. Thousands of felonies committed all across this nation in our polling places. And as far as I can tell, no serious investigation being done. If America loses her free and fair elections, we will lose our freedom, our constitution, and our nation. If the liberal left thinks that they no longer need to fear the ballot box because they own the ballot box, then the federal government will be free to impose its will on the American people. Think about who the liberal left idolizes. Fidel Castro, Mao Zedong, Che Guevara. They are the heroes of the liberal left who are now governing our nation. And if history is a reliable indicator, then we can expect the American left to do what their heroes did, crack down on political dissidents. Now, the Founding Fathers warned us that this day would come. Ronald Reagan told us we would face this. And even the communists told us that this was coming. Now, in 2009, after a year of the Obama regime, the Tea Party sprang into existence. And one year later, the newborn Tea Party caused over 700 left-wing liberals to lose their seats in federal, state, and local elections all across this country. Now the Tea Party is four years old and has been adding members in all 50 states. Make no mistake about it, the politics as usual crowd, both Democrat and Republican, are scared spitless of the Tea Party. Now, if the liberal left decide that the time is right to begin forcing their social ag agendas on us, there will be no doubt who is going to be at the top of their hit list. Tea Partiers, homeschooling families, Bible-believing churches, gun owners, and, of course, the favorite target of dictators for thousands of years, the Jews. How do I know that? That's easy. The Muslim Brotherhood is attached to America's liberal left like conjoined twins. Now, for the last few years, we've been fighting against the erosion of our rights. If I am correct about this shift in Washington, D.C., then we may soon be fighting for much more. 
And frankly, our side is not ready. We are masters of writing firm yet polite letters on our computers and hitting the send button. The liberal left enemies of freedom are masters of intimidation and threats and violence. And we are not ready. But the day is coming when we are going to have to meet these people face to face. It may be providential that T-Teams USA recently came into being. I made a video a few months ago called uh, Patriot Special Forces where I called for Americans who are ready to take a stand to use some of the philosophies from our military's special forces groups to operate in small groups using unconventional tactics to disrupt the liberal agendas in their areas, to start being unpredictable, to challenge the enemies of freedom in ways that they don't expect. We now have chapters in all 50 states, about 4,000 people signed up, 2,600 people signed up for T-Teams the very first day I put it on the net. So we have a real interest in this. We have law enforcement officers, paralegals, and attorneys who have stepped up, and I have asked them to vigorous, vigorously investigate the voter fraud threat with the goal of forcing prosecutions. Now, the Tea Teams are basically the lion hearts of the Tea Party. You know, we, we've all been involved in the Tea Party, and we know that a lot of them are perfectly content to go to the meetings, write their letters, call their representatives, and that's fine. That's the way things have been done for years. But me personally, I'm just not satisfied with the results we've been getting from contacting our local representatives. So the Tea Teams is there for the Tea Party people who are ready to take the fight to the enemy. T-teams.com. Yeah. T-E-A-T-E-A-M-S. T-teams, plural. Yes. Now, at a recent rally, somebody asked me how we can make the Tea Party more effective, and I said, make them feel like they're a part of a team. <coughs> this uh, Roaring Lion logo is our new T-teams patch, and this patch is going to start showing up in town hall meetings and in Washington, D.C., all over the country. We're going to confront the enemies of freedom. We're going to confront the corrupt politicians. And we're going to ask the tough questions. And we're going to have a little fun along the way doing it. That's another one of my hot buttons, is that the media has done a really good job of painting us as angry Americans. And we're, we have a lot of things that we can be angry about. But you know what? We need the support of the American people. And Americans are just not attracted to angry people. So we need to show America that we can have fun while we do our job standing up for the USA. I was at a Tea Party rally in North Carolina a few weeks ago, and the DJ put on some ZZ Top, and I grabbed a pretty little blonde girl, and I, we danced in front of the stage. We need to be fun-loving. That is how we will make an end run around the media's portrayal of us, because remember this, if we do not control our image, the media will control it for us, and it will be ugly. Something to think about. Now, when I made that video, Patriot Special Forces, it got the attention of Captain Larry Bailey, retired Navy SEAL, former commanding officer of the Navy SEAL Training Center in California. And he said, call me. So I called him up, and he says, man, Bill, that's a hell of an idea you got there. That could really work. we got to work together on this. So. Captain Bailey and I have been traveling the country, meeting with retired Special Forces operators, Special Operations Speaks as their group. They have a thousand high-ranking Special Operations officers and enlisted men, and these guys are on the Benghazi investigation like pit bulls on a pork chop. They're not going to give it up. T-Teams USA is now working with them, and through T-teams, the tea parties now have a very good connection with the U.S. military. These guys have their pulse on what's happening. And let me tell you, Mr. Obama has no fans in the U.S. military. So as the attitude from Washington, D.C. turns ugly towards we the people, we the people are rising to the challenge and becoming better educated, using better tactics, and are more dedicated than ever before to see that liberty will not die on our watch. 
Our forefathers passed down a hard-won freedom to us, and many generations have fought for it since then. And we will successfully hand it down to the next generation, even if we have to fight for it. Right. So thank you for asking me to be here tonight, and America, bless God again. Our next speaker is Pamela Geller, the director of S. OIA, Atlas Shrugs. She's a contributor to WND, to the American Thinker, and is probably one of this country's leading exponents on the dangers of Sharia in America. First of all, I want to thank Diane Sori, who made this all possible, who stood up. I get, I, I'm sure that she hasn't told me, but because this subject matter is so, has been rendered so toxic, uh, I am sure that there were forces in the GOP that did not want me to be here. Um, while the Democrats have become the party of jihad, and we see that literally, uh, even in New York, I have a, we have a mayor running, de Blasio, who has promised to stop the counterterrorism programs that has kept that city the most desirable target for the jihadis. Uh, he's promised to s dismantle those programs. And he is, was at a rally, Muslims for uh, de Blasio yesterday, standing with some of the most vicious Jew haters. So when I say it's the party of jihad, it is. On the other hand, because the GOP is the party of freedom, and the party of individual rights, it would be the natural party to fight the encroaching Sharia, which we'll discuss, and jihad. But what happens is, according to the Sharia, you cannot offend or criticize Islam. It doesn't matter if it's true. You cannot offend or criticize Islam. Now, in Muslim countries, if you offend or criticize Islam, you are sentenced to death. And we see in Muslim countries like Afghanistan and Pakistan, many Christians or more secular Muslims are put to death because they blasphemed. Here in the West, uh, they don't assassinate you, but they certainly assassinate your character. They destroy you, they destroy your good name, they destroy your work, they dra drag your name through the mud so that people will not talk about it. And politicians will not talk about it. And any politician that talks about it, you ought to support with every breath of your body. Because it, yes? Again, every headline that refers to me as a hate group. First of all, let me say this. I'm not a hater. I'm a lover. I work for love. I work for freedom. I work for art and music. Do you understand? But we live in an age where veritas odium parit, which is an old Latin axiom, which means truth begets hatred. There is a war on the truth. First of all, I'm not anti-Muslim, OK? I don't care if you worship a stone. Just don't stone me with it. And what we're seeing increasingly in the United States is a media that self-enforces the Sharia. They'll call me a hate group, and yet they'll call care whose leadership has been convicted of terror-related crimes, terror-related crimes. They will call them um, the leading Muslim advocacy group, whose leadership was indicted, were named unindicted co-conspirators in the largest terrorist funding trial in our nation's history, the Holy Land trial. I've never been indicted. I've never been arrested. I have no, but the media calls me the hate group. The media calls me the problem. The media is the problem. Oh, yeah. The media is the problem because there's always going to be good and there's always going to be evil. And this is an eternal battle. This is a human condition. No matter how they try and soft soap it, no matter how they say we've evolved, we've evolved technology, at the end of the day, it is part of the human condition. And there's a battle going on. Now, the media, in my estimation, is the largest weapon that our enemy has in its arsenal. It is insurmountable if, you are, if you're looking to change the media. It's never going to happen. Forget it. You want to wring your hands about it? That is so 1990s, OK? What you need to do is you need to go on the offense. Now, it's a subtle enemy. I mean, it's easy when they're blowing things up. That's easy to point to. 
okay? But what you don't see is the stealth jihad. Take, for example, a couple weeks ago in Kenya. An upscale mall in Nairobi, frequented by Westerners, was targeted for over a year by jihadists, by a devout Muslim group. Now understand something. In this attack on the Westgate Mall in Nairobi was a multinational jihad force. Most of the jihadists in that attack were from the UK and America and across the world. A multinational force. And what they did was they targeted the non-Muslims. They actually separated the Muslims from the non-Muslims. You had to either say an Islamic prayer or you had to say the name of Muhammad's mother. I'd like to know why one Muslim didn't yell out, Amina, not one. Wouldn't that be a way to martyr yourself? Just saying. And I will not go into what they did to the children. The torture, the sharpening of the thing is, making them write their names in blood. But we don't see, we, we, this is not uh, exceptional. Mumbai, remember Mumbai in India? They did the same thing. They separated the Muslims from the non-Muslims. Now, why am I bringing this up? I don't believe all Muslims subscribe to this. And anyone that accuses me of that is actually admitting to it themselves, you see. By saying I'm painting a broad brush, I'm not painting a broad brush. They are, by accusing me. Now, le leaders of the World Muslim Council are asking the media in Kenya not to use the word Islamist, a word I particularly despise because it, it's, it, another, it's another excuse, it's another word that people use because they don't want to say what it is. What's an Islamist? What's a Christianist? What's a Judist? It's a way of saying, it's a way of avoiding the issue. But even so, they don't want the media to tie what happened in Kenya to Islam. Let me say this, the media is not tying it. The jihadists who made the victims recite an Islamic prayer are the ones who tied it. Today on my site, you see video of the attacks where they kill, they stop, they get down, and they pray. They get up and they kill. This is not Pamela Geller doing this. They say, if you use the word Islamist, Islamic, it's a really Islamic, it's a distinction without difference, you're going to incite them. Well, let me tell you something. You can call me every name in the book, and I have been called every name in the book. You couldn't incite me to hurt you, not for a second. But me, just using the word, is going to incite Muslims across the world. I want to know why these leaders of the Muslim world are not redirecting their concerns to the jihadists that are using the Quran to commit these acts of jihad. I want to know why all of these barbs, all of this hostility that's directed at me on a daily basis, the death threats and everything, why isn't it being directed at the Muslims that are committing jihad? Why aren't Muslims looking inward? There's a problem in Islam. There's a problem. And the problem is, we can't talk about the problem. Here in America, we see the media self-enforcing the Sharia. We see schools proselytizing to our children, where they're teaching about the five pillars of Islam. Really, are you teaching about Christianity and the coming of Christ? Are you teaching about the Talmud? What is, what is this? When you see this, and you should be seeing it, you should be reading your children's textbooks because there are entire chapters on Muhammad. There's no chapters on Jesus Christ or Moses. What you need to do is you need to go into the school and you must demand equal time. You want a chapter on Judaism, you want a chapter on Hinduism, you want a chapter on Sikhism, you want a chapter on Christianity. This is what you must do. Don't get into the Islamophobic, don't fall for that nonsense, okay? You want equal time. Because we're violating the Establishment Clause, is what we're doing here. They're showing preference for a particular religion. I do not believe there should be prayer rooms in the schools. I don't believe there should be prayer rooms in the, in the workplace. And of course there are. And I will tell you that everywhere that companies are accommodating to the Muslims are always the companies that get hit with the lawsuits. Disney is being sued because a, a Muslim worker wanted to wear the hijab. So 
Disney said, okay, but you can't be on the floor because we have a dress code since 1957. So we'll put you in the back office. No, I want to be on the floor. So they said, okay. They designed a costume incorporating the hijab into the costume. And she said, I'm not going to wear that ridiculous thing. I don't know if she was talking about the costume or the hijab. But the point is, she's proceeding to sue. Walmart was sued. Target was sued. Uh, cashiers didn't want to handle meat that wasn't halal. So don't work as a cashier. No, it is a way of imposing Islam on the, on the secular marketplace. Hurts. Hertz uh, accommodates Muslims with prayer rooms, with prayer rugs, and prayer times. Well, the problem was is that Muslims were going out for prayer, and they weren't coming back so fast. So Hertz said, look, we'll give you prayer times, but you have to sign out. You have to clock out. No, we're not clocking out. You have to clock out because, we, you know, you, you don't come back. We're not clo clo clocking out. He, they said, Hertz said, you don't clock out, we're going to have to suspend you. They didn't clock out. They suspended them. Lawsuit, and I'm going to tell you something. These companies lose these lawsuits. Target lost. Walmart lost. So this is imposing Islam on the secular marketplace. I have no problem with Muslims that want to live in with us under our rules, under Western law. My problem is when you seek to impose the most brutal and extreme ideology on the face of the earth here in the freest, or what once was the freest country. Now, a couple months ago, Department of Justice Attorney Bill Killian, Bill Kill, William Killian said that he vowed to criminalize social postings that offended Muslims on Twitter and Facebook. He made this announcement, he was going to discuss it at a Muslim outreach meeting, and my organization, we immediately called for a rally, and I want to say something, just so that you know that close to 2,000 people showed up in a town of 10,000 people in, in Tennessee. It was huge. Now, of course, the media never mentioned that the Department of Justice attorney vowed to criminalize um, uh, uh, postings on social media that offended Muslims, which is the Sharia. They said, you know, Tea Party Patriots and the hate monger Gela was protesting a Muslim outreach meeting. They are evil. Do not underestimate them. <laughs> they mean to destroy you. They mean to destroy you. Look what they did to the Tea Party. What was Tea Party? Tea Party was, depending upon who writes the, the, the history books, a historical phenom. People that never got off their couch, people that were never politically involved, stood up and said no. No to Obamacare, no to these bailouts, people that were not politically active, and they called themselves a Tea Party because it was reminiscent of the Tea Party. Now, I've spoken at innumerable Tea Parties. I've been there from the very, very first, and I can tell you I never saw a racist sign. I never heard a racist word. And that was the meme from the very beginning. Immediately, these were racist bigots. So we know they want to destroy this movement. You know they, you must ignore it. You must, you must, you must focus on what's right. And you cannot let any of the confetti that is being thrown at you, it's not confetti really, it's weak old dog, you know what, being thrown at you, you must not let it get in your way. We're really at a historical crossroads in so many ways. First of all, I want to tell you what we do. First of all, I am the uh, president of American Freedom Defense Initiative. It's a human rights organization dedicated to individual rights, freedom of speech, and freedom of conscience. The body of my work, the whole premise of my thinking, my, my epistemology, the nature of my knowledge is individual rights. Right now, I see a leftist jihadic alliance as the most threatening, the gravest threat to our freedoms. And that's what we're battling. Now, I do it on three fronts. The first front is, well, actually my website, of course, is where you, you get news that the media either refuses to cover or covers up. I mean, I cannot keep up with the daily acts of jihad across the world. Even here in America, there are daily, there are daily um, arrests uh, that you never, ever hear about. Even the Boston bombers, I mean, remember, it was a bad immigrant experience. It's not funny. Because as time goes on, the weaponry, the super weaponry gets better, the knowledge gets better, and nothing happens for decades, and then decades happen in a day. So first and foremost is Atlas Shrugs, where I update 15 times a day. Then, of course, there's the demonstrations. When something is wrong, we go. And you go. When you see something wrong, I don't care if it's just you, 
alone, like Bev Pearlson, mother, band of mothers. She would stand on a corner with a sign and her music every day, every day for her son, who was uh, in Afghanistan. That's what you have to do. That's what you have to do. Five people don't. Listen, I see the left. They show up with four people, and it's a great victory. That's you. So we demonstrate. Look, we defeated that Ground Zero mosque. Let me tell you. Oh, yeah. You had the president at an iftar dinner, you know, expressing his support. You had a mayor who said, if we don't build it, the terrorists will win. You can't even, you can't even imagine where they come up with these, you know. Um, so it's not pretty. You know, that's when they labeled me the ADL. The ADL labeled me a hate group. They've condemned Israel for, um, uh, you know, Israel was fighting anti-Semitism, and one of the contestants for the Eurovision, Miss Eurovision contest was, I think she may have been thinking of wearing um, Galliano, and you know what he said about the Jews uh, and Hitler, that Hitler was a great man, and so on and so forth. And Israel said we prefer she didn't wear it, and the ADL condemned, condemned Israel. And the ADL condemned Joan Rivers, who said, look, why don't you concentrate on the real enemies of Israel? So I can't take the Anti-Defamation League seriously. First of all, they defamed a couple in, in, in Colorado that sued them, and it was taken all the way up, I think, uh, right before the Supreme Court. And still they had to pay that couple $10 million. It's not the Anti-Defamation League. It's the Defamation League. And the Southern Poverty Law Center targets vets, military, Patriots, Tea Party, they labeled 1,383 groups last year as hate groups. Not one jihad group. Not one. They don't, they don't, they don't, uh, they don't, qual they don't qualify jihad groups. What else is there, really? So the demonstrations are very important. Getting out there and protesting is very, very important. And that's where your power is. Because you see CARE, when CARE says, we're having a demo, one person shows up because they concentrate on the hallowed halls of power in the media and in politics. We are the people. We are the people. We are the power. Oh, yes. Now, I just want to go into my ads a little bit. Uh, because what happened was, and I'm sure you've heard gre uh, a good deal about the ads, uh, I want to say a couple things qualified for the record. First of all, I've never did an ad out of the blue. Like, oh, I think I'm going to run an ad just to piss people off. It was always in response to a campaign. In New York City, there was not one but two anti-Israel campaigns, and they were a blood libel with the maps, the fallacious maps, you know. Uh, I saw one, and then I saw the second one, and I, th I said, I'm gonna have to run, I have to run an ad. And so I'm sure you know this ad. I'm going to bring my ads over. That caused quite the brouhaha. Thanks. In any war between the civilized man and the savage, support the civilized man. Support Israel, defeat jihad. Now, this ad was rejected by the MTA. New York City government rejected this ad because of the word savage. Apparently, the savages were offended. <laughs> and so we, we sued, and we won. Took a year. And my, my law firm, David Yerushalmi, Robert Muse, American Freedom Law Center, we have a number of huge, huge applause for them, warriors. And not only did we win, it wasn't even a narrow victory. It was such a victory that they had, to, they had to throw out their ad rules and standards and rewrite their ad rules because their rules were deemed unconstitutional. This ad ran, and literally, you heard about it around the world. It was everywhere. It was in Europe. It was everywhere. Um, and while it was very hostile, and the media was very hostile, if you want to see, for example, uh, an exam um, a perfect example is me on CNN with Erin Burnett, okay, who is, uh, you know, attacking me. I'm very sober, very level-headed, and, uh, you know, savage. That's a terrible word. And I said, well, did you see the beheading of Daniel Pearl? I, she said, yes. I said, was that savage? She goes, oh, I... I don't, I, wouldn't, I don't know, call it savage, it was murder. So you see, you expose them. And I said to her, any war on innocent civilians is savagery. The targeting of the Fogel family, the thousands of rockets into Sederot, Nashkalan from, from, from Gaza, 9-11, 7-7, 3-11, Bali, Mumbai. This is savagery. You get to 
see these things in a very hostile environment, but people hear them for the first time. So it's not pretty, but it works. Now, every time they do an ad, I respond. I'm going to tell you that right now. Hamas care, as, as linked to by the uh, Department of uh, U.S. Government, uh, decided, because I use the word jihad in my Israel ad that I just showed you, that they were going to rebrand the word jihad. And so they ran these ads. My jihad is to stay fit, despite my busy schedule. <laughs> A bunch of these. Everyone more ridiculous than the next. I'm sure that is this girl's jihad, but that's not, what, that's not the problem, is it? So I did a series of ads, just like that, using actual Muslims and their actual quotes. Okay? We used the Fort Hood Jihadi. Reloading, firing again, reloading, firing again, while screaming Alu Akbar, victim of Major Nadal Hassan, Fort Hood J Jihad mass murderer. Okay? We did Hamas MTV. Did you know Hamas has an MTV? Yeah, they sing. This is what they sing. Killing Jews is worship that draws us close to Allah. That's his jihad. What's yours? And on and on. The first thing that we are calling you to is Islam. I use the Prime Minister of Turkey who said the mosques are our fortresses, the minarets are our bayonets, and the Muslims are our soldiers. That's the Prime Minister of Turkey who said to uh, President Obama, there is no extreme Islam, there is no moderate Islam, Islam is Islam. And what wound up happening, of course, now mind you, every time I run these ads, I have to substantiate every one of these extensively. I have to source every ad I run, just so that you know, okay? Um, in San Francisco, when I ran this campaign, the city council issued its first resolution of its kind, condemning me. Yes. Condemning me. And because they did that, I did a separate new campaign for them, pulling the quotes from Muslim leaders on homosexuality. Because San Francisco is the, ca is the mecca of the gay community, is it not? So I ran these ads. Here's Karadawi, Karadawi, Sheikh Karadawi is the leader of the Muslim world, who was banned from Egypt until Barack Hussein Obama backed the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, and he came back. Of course, now he's on the outs because freedom lovers in Egypt, or freedom seekers, through the yoke of the Islamic supremacists off in Egypt. So what did Obama do? He just cut the aid this week to Egypt because, because he is backing the Muslim Brotherhood. He backed the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. Now, if you think that's a mistake, or you know, perhaps he had it wrong, I will tell you, if you didn't read my book, The Post-American Presidency, The Obama Administration's War on America, which I wrote in 2009, and I, I predicted all this, I will tell you that when he came into office and he made his apology tour to the Muslim world, remember he went to Al-Azhar University, the leading Islamic university in the world, to, to apologize for America, he invited the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood had been banned had been banned in Egypt, he invited the Muslim Brotherhood. Do you know Mubarak and his cabinet couldn't go to that speech because he had the Brotherhood there? And after that, he had mid-level cabinet meetings, his people, with the Brotherhood. This was in June of 2009, at the same time as the people of Iran, the only freedom revolution that took place in the Middle East, were took to the streets with signs apologizing for 79, the students, with signs, Obama, you're either with us or against us. He ignored it. And how did you know that was a real freedom revolution? I'll tell you how you knew. It was led by women. <laughs> women with lipstick, women with eyeliner, women with hijab, women. You don't, never saw that in Libya. You never saw, they literally, what became the icon of the Iranian revolution was that girl, Netta Sultan, a beautiful girl who's just standing peacefully in the street shot in the head, all of a sudden she's gorgeous, and then blood is pouring out of her face. And it's a video, it's on video. Did the media make a, a, a martyr out of her? 
If you know about Netta, it's because you read blogs and you're online. You don't know about her from CNN, and you don't know about her from Diane Sawyer. Here's an ad that the FBI was running in Seattle, Faces of Global Terrorism. It's their Reward for Justice program, where they offer upwards of $25 million to the kill and capture of the world's worst terrorists. Now, mind you, it's been a successful program. So they ran this ad, and apparently Muslim groups were offended by it. And so the FBI voluntarily took the ad down. Now, I'd like to know why Muslims were offended by this. First of all, let's forget about the fact that nowhere in the ad does it say Muslim. If these people hijacked the religion, if these people hijacked, and I don't know what that means because they're quoting Quran chapter and verse. They're not twisting. It's quoting Quran chapter and verse, but okay. Then wouldn't they want this up there? Like, yeah, get those bastards. They're ruining it for us. No, they want them down. So I submitted the same ad, but of course put my little AFDI instead of FBI, and they were rejected because it's demeaning and disparaging to Muslims. Last Thursday, that lawsuit was fired, uh, filed. Oh yeah. <laughs> Have you been to Europe lately? It's frightening what's going on there. And to be a Jew in Europe, it's funny. The Times of Israel did a piece two, two days ago. A reporter said, you know, I've been hearing it's really scary for Jews over here in Europe. Uh, I thought I would put on a kippah and go for a walk. And he did. And he went for, he spent two hours with the kippah, and he outlines everything that happened. Uh, you know, he w was uh, walking, and they said, with the F word, Jew, you know, and they were, the crowd was menacing him, and he explains, but, but, and then in the article it says, but nobody heard him, and I'm thinking, look what you just went through, two hours wearing a kippah, imagine going through your whole life like that. Norway is Judenrein, it's, dev it's void of Jews, okay? The UK banned me. They banned me and Robert Spencer from speaking, laying a wreath on Armed Forces Day at the site of a, a soldier who was beheaded by a jihadist. And you would never have known that if there wasn't somebody there with a camera, with the guy with the bloody hands and the bloody meat cleaver, citing Quran chapter and verse. But they banned me. But they let Arifi in, who said that the, the Muslims should crush the skulls, according to the Quran of the infidel. He's allowed in. He's speaking in London. And that's supposed to be, you're damn right, it's a badge of honor. That's supposed to be a reflection on me or a reflection on the dimitude and the submission and the surrender of the UK British authorities. Who's it a reflection on? And the whole Palestinian thing, look, I'm going to tell you right now, it is a fiction, it is a false narrative. The war against the Jews is a jihad. If you don't know about uh, Islamic anti Semitism, the, go to islamicjewhatred.com or go to islamicantisemitism.com. I cite chapter and verse from the Quran. What was the excuse before 67? Before Yasser Arafat and his KBG, KGB agents developed this brilliant marketing term for the, um, a modern argument to an age old hate. What was the excuse before 67? What about 48? Before 48, Palestinian Muslims and Palestinian Jews were living in Palestine, which is Israel. They stole that name, I got it. And they were conducting pogroms against the Jews in 21, 29, 36. And who was the leader of these pogroms? The Mufti al Husseini. The Mufti al Husseini, who was Hitler's partner. Hitler's partner. Aligned with Hitler, Hitler lived in Berlin in the lap of luxury on Hitler's dime, made weekly radio broadcasts every week from Berlin to the Axis powers and to the Muslim world, citing Quran chapter and verse on why the Jews must be annihilated, and was responsible for the death of 400,000 Jewish women and children. And yet we never hear about that. Oh, the Nazis, they were terrible. The Nazis, the Nazis, yeah, the Nazis were terrible. But how come they got a free pass? How come we never hear about the Muslim world during World War II? How come they never apologized? Where's the remorse? It's alive. It's alive and it's in the Palestinian fight. There are two states, Jordan and Israel. Boom. It's outrageous. It's outrageous. It's a myth. It's a lie. 
and you have to, you know, stop buying into the lie and explaining the lie. Stand up for the truth. If you're going to go down, go down standing. You know, if you're going to go down, go down with the truth. Because things are getting quite terrible, and we've got another three and a half years of this guy. And he's so tough with the Republicans, you know? He's so tough. And the media, I mean, look at the media with the shutdown. It was the Republicans and it was Republicans. It was Republicans and it was Republicans. Meanwhile, they were printing those signs months and months ago. The government was shut down, you know? Immediately, the government was shut down. And we all know that if he didn't close those open air parks, nobody would have known there was a shutdown. Nobody cared. This big, giant behemoth that eats up so much money, you would never know. He had to punish the people. And then with each, with each proposal, a legislation that the House proposed, he turned it down. But when the Senate com came up with this terrible compromise, and let me tell you something, the Republicans had no choice. Yeah, they had no choice. It was a lose-lose situation, lose-lose. Why? Because they were being blamed for everything. They were being blamed in the media and everybody was buying it. You saw the numbers. Why should their numbers be so low? Because the media was successful. And all of the talk about Syria, all of the talk about Obamacare was nowhere. They loved it. Just it was a, a blame America, blame the Republicans every day. I don't know about you, but I got my new health care rates. I got my new health care rates, and for the first time in my life, I'm not going to have health care. No, I'm not, because with a $12,000, I can't, I don't have a choice. $12,000 deductible, which is what I had, it's $1,800 a month. Okay? So, so the thing is, uh, I, I'm, I'm, pay, I'm always paying out of pocket anyway, but $1,800 a month. And a $4,000 deductible is $3,000 a month. So now what I'm going to do, I pay out of pocket anyway, and God forbid that nothing terrible should happen to me, but if it does, well, there's no pre-existing conditions. I'll sign up then. But that's what's going to happen. This is a nightmare that the American people, they have to suffer. Sorry. There is a punishment for voting this way. And yeah, we're going to go down with it. But, what, but while he, I love Cruz, I love him. He stood up and he has it on record that the Republicans were against this abortion. It's on record now. And that's a good thing because it's going to come back. It's going to come back to bite everybody. So this is the media again. The media, it was, it was, such, a, it was such a brilliant play. Tough he is with the American people. The old people that wanted to see the World War II, eh, his barricades were up, he's so tough. And in the world, he's a mouse. And worse, he sides with them. Do you know that when France needed help fighting Al-Qaeda in Mali, he wanted to charge them $50,000 a day or an hour for a tanker? So you know what the French said, Phew. but that's amazing. That's an amazing story that people don't even know about. So you have him, okay? And, and who in the world is going to take it? It's our place. There is nobody. We are a unique and singular uh, moment in human history. We were the first moral government based on individual rights. Individual rights. Never in the history of man was there ever a government based on individual rights. And everything brilliant and magnificent and noble that we achieved was a logical fidelity to that principle. And it's like there's a coup. And nobody's, nobody's fighting back. It's, 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 it's really frightening. So I implore you to get involved, however it goes. I, look, I believe that good will triumph. At what cost? I can't tell you. But it is bleak. And you've, we've got to increase our numbers, because that's where the power is. I believe the power is with the people. I believe the power is with you. If history has taught us anything, it's that the individual can change the course of human events. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.